bell ringers are ringing the bells around the building and in a moment we'll open with a song. So we're actually gonna invite Renee to play it through one time before we sing. This is hymn 354, We Laugh, We Cry. Beautiful, thank you. Welcome one and all here on Zinedale Road and with us on Zoom. My name is Pastor Isabel Call, and it is a joy to serve as the minister of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Manhattan. Our vision is to be a vibrant, inclusive congregation to be widely known as a safe haven and a force for justice. We are a fellowship with many leaders, so I want to take a moment and acknowledge the other folks involved in the service today. We have Kathy Hedge as our Zoom host. Rob Morrison is our lead tech. Uh, and let's see, we have Renee Brown on piano. We have Sarah Desmond offering our acknowledgement later and many other people behind the scenes. And I wanna also take a special moment of thanks to people who have been painting our space. Uh, Bryce Sobrock and Katie Kingry Page have been working on the wall here. And Jean Sievers did our door, which is looking good. So thank you all. Uh, one other announcement in addition to the slides we saw earlier, staff email will be out of service tonight and into tomorrow. We're getting a whole new email server. So if you email us and don't hear back, that's why give us a couple days and maybe give us another nudge. I am leading the service today with uh, my friend and colleague Harmony Gates. Harmony is a lifelong investigator of human connection, a dancer, body therapist, embodied artist, mediator, and relationship coach, a connection catalyst. Harmony helps people be authentic and connect and relate with each other and others genuinely and satisfyingly. She's joining us this morning from her new home in the southern tip of Texas. Since the pandemic, she's been offering an online dance space three days a week to a dispersed but lovingly connected community, as well as participating online in other dance events. 
I met Harmony in Berkeley seven years ago at a small contact improvisation dance group. Uh, after our weekly gathering, we would sit and reflect on what we had experienced. And Harmony would always describe her experience in a way that gave us all insight. She draws people into the conversation and builds community through exploring what makes our experiences similar and complementary. In a space of highly diverse equals, Harmony demonstrates leadership. And so that's why I invited her. Uh, our dance community shares many qualities with UUFM. We are a safe space in times of wellness and ease, and we can hold each other to grow through and beyond the inevitable challenges and impairments that come our way. It takes multiple people improvising together to make such a space, and we need leaders and role models like you all and like Harmony. So I am so grateful to her for saying yes to speaking with us. So Harmony will now lead us in lighting the chalice with these words from Desmond Tutu. Ubuntu, I am because you are, is part of a longer Zulu phrase, which literally means that a person is a person through other people. We are different so that we can know our need of one another, for no one is ultimately self-sufficient, writes Tutu. Thank you, Harmony. I think it, here in the sanctuary, your very first word cut off, and that was a very important word. It's the word Ubuntu, which is the, the Zulu word Harmony was speaking of. So we're going to move into the time for all ages. It has two parts today. First is a video and then an activity. So here comes the video. One afternoon, not long ago, with the sun tumbling in from the windows, a small bright dot flashed across the carpet. And you know who else saw the dot? Into it, the teenage kitten. She was very, very, very interested in the dot. But the dot was slippery. Each time she captured it, it got away. This dot was not an ordinary thing. Catching it was going to take some strategy. It was going to take some thought. Intuit would need to give the dot some attention, follow it with her attention. Now, her curiosity did have a way of getting ahead of her. But perhaps it would take her interesting places. Intuit decided to follow the dot wherever it would take her. Yes, perhaps they could be friends. It seemed the dot agreed. For as much attention Intuit gave the dot, and as much as the dot led Intuit, the dot wanted Intuit to keep up. It followed her, even as she followed it. Now, as in all relationships, there will always be times of rest. Intuit will always need the opportunity to disengage, reset, focus on herself. But then she will be prepared again for play. On this particular afternoon, as Intuit gave her attention, the dot Learn to move at Intuit's speed, holding her attention. 
and carrying her around the room. Leader, follower, attention, play, love. Like Intuit and the Dot, we too can build trust through play, giving our attention, sharing space, and finding companionship. This is such a perfect video for the activity that I'm going to invite us into. I'm hoping to give you a feeling for meeting, reading, and engaging with one another non-verbally through sensory attunement only. The activity will involve touching or virtual touching with your hands. It's a simple but perhaps novel activity for some of you. And I've attempted to structure it in a way so that both online and in-person folks can participate as they wish. So I'll guide the short activity in two parts. First, I'll address those attending online. And Isabel and I will give the online, online folks a short demonstration. And then once our demonstration is complete, the online folks will be invited to go, go ahead and give it a try with each other, interacting from inside your individual Zoom squares, but with each other. And once the online folks begin to explore the activity, I'll address those of you who are attending in person. And I'll guide the in-person in folks into um, the initial nonverbal meeting and greeting phases of the exercise, and then I'll give you some suggestions for how to explore simple engagement with each other. I have to admit that doing this remotely online is a total experiment, so let's hope it works. And for those of you that are attending remotely, you'll have to have your camera on if you wanna play. All right. So those of you who are online, oh, first the demonstration. Then we have Isabel on the screen with me. Hopefully. Did Sorry, we want to do a gallery view? Go ahead and do gallery view. I don't see you. Yeah, gallery okay. view. We're buffering. Okay. Technology is my friend. <laughs> All, All right. right. Here we go. There you are. All right, so Isabel is next to me. Hopefully everybody sees Isabel and then me and then UUFM and then the rest of us who are online here. Okay, so Isabel and I are gonna meet and greet non-verbally and move together in our squares. I'm gonna talk us through this and then you can watch us first. And then once you see and you think you get it, We'll see how it works. Because some people are on top, some people are next to each other. We're gonna work next to each other on our screens. So Isabel, bring your hands up in front of you and then bring them to the side of your square, either back to back or palm, whichever works easiest for you. And then just to the edge. So I'm pretty close. Let me move back a little bit so my hands are more your size. I can do that in a second. Oops, that way. Whoops, wrong, wrong way. There we go. So here we go. So we're going to, in a sense, actually, we can all do this together. It looks like touch hands so that it's the same place on the screen. And then watch and see. I guess I'll initiate. Hands are going to move, and you want to stay side by side with the hands that you see yourself touching. So you want to get all the way to the edge of your square. So, like your hands are touching the other hands. Yeah, you got to stretch out a little bit there. There you go. So now my hands are going to go up and Isabel's are going to go up with me. And actually, I'm with Catherine on one side, too. So we're all going to reach together. And then we're all going to come down at the same speed. You got to kind of watch 
the two hands on either side of you, including your own hands. Yeah. And I see Bob doing it just this way. That might even be easiest side by side on your hands because then you don't have to bend your wrist. And then up again. And Mark and Terry are having trouble with this. That's okay. Let me just take my attention back off of the demonstration, which actually, as we leave, oh, I don't know if it'll work. I guess everybody to the left of us can do this. What's going on with Mark and Terry? You guys can do it with each other, with the aunt, with the in-person people, okay? Because you're next to each other in physical space. So participate with the in-person people. All right, so now we need to, I need to probably see the input. Yeah, I need to see UFM. Oh, okay. If you guys want to keep on playing and you're on screen, you can actually try to see if you can do one up and one down on either side of your screen. So, you, you know, you're still connected, but you're, you're going to actually see slowly how you can do that as a group. This is a total experiment. Now, for those of you who are in person sitting, I imagine in rows, I'm mean, gonna imagine you're in rows, I cannot see you. Uh, I think we could probably change the setting here so you can, okay. we'll put a camera <clears throat> on the people in the room. Okay, one camera. Everybody else on screen maybe can still play. There we go, I can see there you. There we go. Okay, well, I see that you're pretty far spaced apart. That could make this difficult. If you're willing to play this, so I can't move you on my screen. If you're willing to play, you need to sit next to at least one other person, if not a couple people on either side of you, if you're in the live space. So I'll let you move and get kind of close. Yeah. Okay, what I can see is some pretty much people are settled now. So what I want you to do is similar, but you're actually going to touch each other's hands. But I don't want you to touch yet. What I want you to do is bring your hands up. If you can see me, maybe you spotlight me at this point. I don't know. And then since you're side by side, you're going to bring the back of your hand close to, but not quite touching the back of the person's hand next to you. Take a breath there. You maybe know this person, you maybe don't know them that well. And then I want you to just press your hand a little bit in, like almost Velcro, so that the backs of your hands are touching. If you're on the end, you can let that arm go down if you want, or you can keep it up. And now I want you to press enough so that someone, and we don't know who, is going to start to raise a hand, and you'll follow that and go up with it. So someone's actually starting it, but now everybody is more or less following. And whenever someone wants to lower hands, anyone that's in that string can start to lower a hand and you can bring your hands back down. And let's do that one more time. Anyone can, ah, I see already somebody doing every other hand. So. You can do different things with your hands as long as you, it's almost like your hands are a shock absorber pressing into the other hand a little bit. So you can feel them, kind of glue to them and follow or guide them or both. And two hands can do two different things. And you can even take it, once you feel this a little bit, you can take it sideways a little bit into the person's space and out. And notice that you're respond, you're always listening, but you're also inviting, but you're responding. Are you the person that waits more or do you like to get things going? Maybe you can do the opposite of what's your normal default. All right, that's lovely. If you wanna keep it up, you can, or I'll just bring this to a close by what you can do is bring your hands back down to your side and just thank the person that you had you did this with. And I hope that was fun and enjoyable for everyone and maybe something different that you haven't done before.
That was meeting and greeting the pressure and then exploring. Once you have your hand next to somebody else, you're engaging in hand play and hand dance. Thank you so much, Harmony. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Just, I want to show you, Harmony, if you can see my little box, you'll be able to see the other folks in the room. Yeah. Give her a wave. Yeah. Hey, everybody, thank you. I could see people from the back. It was great. <laughs> Good. Was Good. Well, that was our time for all ages. Thank you, everybody, for participating. However you participated, let's sing the young and young at heart to wherever they want to be next. Each month, UUFM directs collections to a community organization that serves those in need with the Helping Hands Fund. We've placed an offering basket in the back of this sanctuary, the entrance to the sanctuary. You can also donate by going to our website, uh, uufm.net slash donate, and direct your donations to any of the social support funds Donations not designated to a particular fund will go toward our Helping Hands recipient for the month of October, which is the Crisis Center. The center was founded in 1979 to provide free and confidential services to victims of domestic violence and sexual assault 24-7, 365 days a year. The center serves this five-county region the Fort Riley military installation, and also administers the statewide Kansas crisis hotline. I'd also like to invite you to use this time to share your joys and sorrows. If you're here in the sanctuary, you can write on the paper near you, and please let me know if you need one or a pen. Um, if you're here, on Zoom, you're welcome to type something into the chat for Kathy to read later. And now I invite Renee to play.
Amen and blessed be. We've come to the time in the service when we share our burdens and amplify our celebrations. Let us call up a spirit of generosity, vulnerability, courage, and compassion as we listen to what has been shared. So there are joys, joys about the painting that's been done here in our space, here in the sanctuary. And I don't see other joys here coming forward, but I think I saw some on Zoom. Kathy, what were the joys that were shared? Yes, we have a joy from Karen Hummel. She really enjoyed her first chalice meeting at the Hobrox on Thursday evening. So that's a nice joy. And we have a, a joy from Harmony. I am so grateful for this opportunity to share my passion with all of you. And thank you so much, Bob and Mike, for responding to my invitation to join me here today. So that is exciting. Um, and uh, uh, we have a note from Mickey. Uh, just want to share that one of my students said that I am one of his favorite professors besides Slavomir and Shannon. This tells me something about UUFM. So it's uh, through Mickey. I wasn't sure if that was for Mickey or for Les, but maybe you can clarify that for us. That's very exciting. And we do have one concern. Thank you for all of those. Joyce, yes, glad to have visitors joining us. Welcome. Yeah, what, what sorrows came in, Kathy? Oh, good energy. Kathy, Kathy, could you start again? Your, your video is a little jumpy. Actually, um, Kathy, if you can hear me, let me ask you to turn your camera off and that might smooth up your audio. All right. Yes, let me get that in the, is that bet that's better. Yes. Okay. So Doug Walter shares, I'd appreciate your thoughts and good energies on Friday when I undergo surgery for a broken clavicle on my left shoulder, the result of a bicycling accident a few days ago. It's my first broken bone in 67 years. And as the attending urgent care physician said, it's a doozy. I would also appreciate any help that friends can offer to keep our blessing box stocked as I step away from that for a few weeks. So, ouch. <laughs> wow, Doug. Okay, thank you for letting us know. Oh, we'll be thinking of you and keeping track of you and your progress. Hmm. Yeah, we had a sorrow here in the space, thinking of Doug. I'm glad that you're here with us online, Doug. Were there other sorrows online, Kathy? I don't think so. No. Okay. We also had one here in the space from Mark Mayfield, uh, who shares, my mother fell and broke her ankle and she goes to surgery Tuesday. She's expecting four to six weeks of recovery. Oh, thank you for sharing. So broken bones today. Uh, prayers and good wishes for, for healing and for the mending uh, to, to be strong, strong in ways maybe you didn't know were possible before the break. Our sorrows and concerns extend to all those who suffer in our community and around the world. And I invite you now to open your hearts, especially to the victims of oppression and violence, war and genocide. And so, and now I invite Sarah Desmet uh, for a reading. These are the words of the indigenous journalist, Julian Brave Noisecat, 
who speaks of the painful history of this land and the resilience of its descendants. I noticed Native people posting videos of themselves dancing and praying for a sick world. The last time Native life seemed on the brink of apocalypse, at the end of the 19th century, the Indians were also dancing. They called it the ghost dance. It foretold a world in which the colonists disappeared, the buffalo returned, and the land was restored to the people. That spiritual movement ended on December 29, 1890, when the United States military gunned down hundreds of Lakota ghost dancers and buried their bodies in a mass grave. A week after the massacre, L. Frank Baum, who later wrote The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, penned an editorial in the Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer, quote, our only safety depends on the total extermination of the Indians, he wrote. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. Then his nation called us savages and made our people into mascots for their sports franchises. Maybe they were so haunted by us and what they did to take this land that they had to forget about their crimes, to put it out of their nation's memories and history books. As Native people, we've endured some of the darkest chapters in history and emerged knowing who we are, where we come from, and what we stand for. We've inherited a vision so audacious, it terrified our oppressors. It's a worldview that celebrates beauty, defiance, and a playful wagging of the finger at the people who tried to kill us. After the pandemic, but as the climate crisis unfolds, maybe more people will understand what it means to survive and still dream like us. Let us join together in a moment of silence as we honor the sorrow and resilience of our indigenous neighbors and their ancestors. We hold these truths alongside the sorrows and resilience in our own lives and histories, recognizing that we are all one race. May we all celebrate beauty and defiance and tap into those truths that make us strong and kind and fierce and whole.
please join me in body and spirit. There's an invitation, an opportunity to move our bodies and move our breath with the song, Let It Be a Dance. Sing the chorus one more time. Maybe we can go back to page one. Dance, we do. Lovely, thank you all. And now I invite Harmony forward virtually for her reflection. Hmm. I'd like to begin my reflection with a poem attributed to the Sufi Hafiz. It's called, I Know the Way You Can Get. I know the way you can get when you have not had a drink of love. Your face hardens, your sweet muscles cramp. Children become concerned about a strange look that appears in your eyes, which even begins to worry your own mirror and knows. Squirrels and birds sense your sadness and call an important conference in a tall tree. They decide which secret code to chant to help your mind and soul. Even angels fear, fear that brand of madness that arrays itself against the world and throws sharp stones and spears into the innocent and into oneself. I know the way you can get if you had not been drinking love. You might rip apart every sentence your friends and teachers say looking for hidden clauses. You might weigh every word on a scale like a dead fish. You might pull out a ruler to measure from every angle in your darkness the beautiful dimensions of a heart you once trusted. I know the way you can get if you have not had a drink from love's hand. That is why all the great ones speak of the vital need to keep remembering God. So you will come to know and see him as being playful and wanting, just wanting to help. That is why Hafiz says, bring your cup near me for all I care about is quenching your thirst for freedom. All a sane man can ever care about is giving love. Mm -hmm. 
So I have an opportunity to share a reflection with you. And I wanna tell you a little bit about how my words came to me. Isabel invited me to do this and I wasn't clear why she even asked me and the, the theme was courage. So I asked her to send me some questions that I could answer. And she was wonderful in providing me with some questions that gave me a chance to really thoughtfully think about and answer. And so what I've done is I've woven those questions into my reflection and that's how I will offer it to you. What is contact improvisation dance and why do I dance this form? Since that's how Isabel and I met and know each other. Dancing, especially contact improvisation, requires me to stop thinking and attend through my senses. And with a really active mind like mine, this is really a restful shift for me. For me, dancing is playful and delightful. It, it engages my attention in a spacious, non-linear, discovery-based way. My awareness opens in this very delicious way that I long for and don't usually access through words and conversation. And partner dancing brings me into non-thinking, non-verbal, kinesthetic, and visceral, emotional relationship with another person. It's a spontaneous, fully embodied, present, fully expressive way to meet, enjoy, engage, interact, explore, listen, respond, and co-create with other humans. It's spontaneous, it's dynamic, it's playful, and it's mutual. I've been dancing this form for over 25 years now, and it's really kind of new on the planet. And the founder, Steve Paxton, of the form explains, while in contact, and this is a touch-based dance, lean into your partner, and then you move in a way that you cannot predict with them. There's no goal, there's no steps. It just occurs between two bodies. He says, while in contact, we attend to our own reflexes, which have been stimulated by the other's movements. Our reflexes move us, and this causes our partner to move, like we did in the exercise. This cycle of movement res and responses is continuous and it forms the basis of the dance dialogue. For me, I was thinking about this when I watched the movie Avatar. This is somewhat like the bond. If you've watched the movie, there's a bond made between human, the human-like cat, blue people, and the creatures they mount and ride, the kind of horse and the kind of dragon that they get on. And they do this bond and in that same kind of bond in contact improv, there's a joining and then a blending of energies that essentially joins two distinctly different beings into one entity for a period of time. My purpose in dancing contact improv is to invite enjoyment and pleasure and to be able to feel the sense of intimacy and sharing movement, expression, and energy with another person. The joy in the moment is the dance. And I believe the kind of social and group dancing we're more familiar with is done for its own sake as well. It's not to achieve something or get something done or get stars on the charts. I don't feel ambitious or competitive when I dance and the satisfaction arises in the doing of it. It's an act of co-creation and blending. And creativity is a source of joy, delight and satisfaction for me. Sharing interactively and creatively with another person is the ultimate experience of intimacy in my book. And in the dance, we become one co-creating as we go. 
and it's an irresistible high. So how has contact dance been important on my life path? Dance has given me family, intimacy, social confidence, and personal comforts. For a lot of my life, I was a social loner and extremely socially anxious. My family didn't offer me a sense of belonging or of mattering. I didn't feel seen or heard there. I learned to be invisible, to placate my mother, who seemed to me to need all the attention and to be able to offer any, at least to me. I found myself craving something I didn't even know how to name or describe, kind of a deep emptiness or loneliness. And I had no experience of feeling seen, emotionally included, cared about or appreciated growing up and in my early years. In face-to-face -face conversations or when attempting to speak in groups, I felt profound panic. I either froze or I experienced myself as stealing attention, grabbing it and running with it, if I even dared to speak up at all. When I discovered the contact dance form, I realized for the first time the possibility of safely exploring conversation, communication, and connection and human interaction without needing to speak at all. I didn't even need to make eye contact or face the person I was dancing with. I could communicate entirely through touch and movement. And I didn't have to stress over how to ask for attention or take a turn receiving it. I found dancers could both express and listen simultaneously. And so the first time in my life, I was able to purely be responsive in the presence of another person without falling into the trauma induced fears that I had around social engagement. Fears of being ignored or rejected or emotionally punished for desiring and asking for attention and asking for engagement and interaction. This was amazing. I could engage with another through the language of touch and kinesthetic movement without constantly watching and monitoring myself. Even so, after years of dancing in the nonverbal dance spaces where I play, ecstatic dance and other forms and contact, I still, I still had to learn how to become comfortable with face-to-face -face verbal communication. And it took many years in addition of risking and practicing in verbal, so, in verbal social settings you know, to risk asking a question or sitting next to someone or talking a little bit of a story without feeling totally anxious or feeling it, but talking anyway. And it's still, it comes up for me just here and now, knowing I have witnesses in an audience, there's a part of me that's just a little bit anxious. I'm not totally relaxed. So I also found nonviolent communication towards uh, in the last, 10 or 15 years, and that was really helpful. Um, it's a helpful practice, practice for me and has supported my learning a lot. So let me talk a little bit about partnering in dance. This is something we learn in contact dance is that my first and constant partner is the floor. I move in relation to the floor in response to the forces of physics and gravity and the centripetal and centrifugal forces, like how we move is relating to our environment. We learn to move in our environment, not separate. It's not a mental process. The floor is a constant in the way it and physical forces act are predictable and non-judgmental, unlike relating with people 
who have all these opinions and judgments, right? I could move within the floor and go, oh yeah, that happens every time I do that. It's consistent. I don't, it's not because I'm bad or because they don't like me. It's just the way it works. So I could learn from that without feeling so much sort of, uh, I don't know, so personal, uh, personal response. I don't know what to say, what to call that exactly. But, um, and then the, as our bodies change, even the way we learn to move, those strategies change as well. So I learned how to physically navigate within these forces and move with intention and grace and balance and strength and flexibility and fluidity. Most of us learn this in our infancy and early childhood, and that's how we develop the movement patterns that we have. In contact improv now, we have the addition of other bodies who have learned to move in the space. And our bodies must first meet as we did with our hands through an initial touch. It could be hands, it could be however we meet physically in contact, any part of the body can touch another part of the body. There's, it's just based on physics and movement and touch and without charge of what part of the body is touching. So our bodies meet and then we negotiate how to join together and move basically as one body. We move in tandem and in collaboration. And in that way, we join, we blend, we become one. So how do we do that? It, the language is touch. It's sensory based and two or more people learn each other's movement signal as they dance, explore together by moving with each other. They learn each other, they learn who they are in relation to that person and we establish a shared language. The movements are unpredictable, but they occur within a known field of the physical laws. We don't use any words and we don't use music. So Isabel asks me, how is life like contact improv? For me, life has been and continues to be a journey of self-discovery. I learn myself through the situations that life presents. I learn myself in the ways I find to negotiate with the situations that life presents. I'm responsive, I respond. And through that responsiveness, I learn myself and I create my life. Dancing improvisationally requires a constant responsiveness. In both life and dance, I'm creating and responding moment to moment, both to what seems like outer energies and to what I might call a felt or inner sense and inner knowing, my own inner experience. So for me, life is a dance and learning my partner and what works for both of us, inviting witness or providing or offering witness or accepting witness. I ebb and I flow between these two energies and these roles. And sometimes I fall into moments of total grace where I simultaneously be and witness it all. How does courage relate to connection and engagement? Well, you know, the minute we connect socially or want to, there's this possibility of rejection. We try, we ask, or we, you know, we come across another person. And so it's risky. It's risky, risky to express and to declare, and it's risky to initiate. It's risky to ask in that emotional sense of what's gonna to happen to our sense of belonging um, or inclusion. And it's really a lot safer to wait and just respond to what comes. But after years of dancing, I realized that I really enjoy and delight in my own dance 
and in my own dancing. And I don't need to engage with another in order to dive into that deep experience of the exploratory dance. So that has given me a freedom. It's like I am whole by myself. And of course I'm connected to everything, but I don't really need the approval or acceptance of another person in order to feel complete and happy in myself. I no longer, I enjoy that, but I don't need it. It doesn't ruin my day if it doesn't happen. And so with that freedom, I'm at choice about how and whether to engage with other people. So I can safely invite attention or ask for it, or I can offer to provide it. Because if the answer is no, I still have my primary partner, myself, my own body, my own interconnection. I can focus, I can focus my attention inwardly and witness myself in movement. I can even do solo movement play. And I can learn about myself that way. So I have a practice for years of just getting quiet without music and moving and just kind of watching myself move and exploring how I move. It's fascinating. I guess it's how, you know, scientists that look at the cell or any other part would go, oh, look, this is how it works. So Isabel asked me how I invite someone to connect. And of course I do that on the dance floor as well as in social settings with words. Sometimes I ask for attention. Sometimes I offer attention. But either way, the way I approach it is I connect first inside. So I know I'm whole and whatever's gonna happen isn't going to throw me off or put me in trauma or anything else. I'm good. Then I wait for and I trust and I follow where my attention and interest wants to focus and wants to go. And then I pay close attention to the person that I'm drawn to. And I kind of sample their energy, just get a feel. I look for signs of openness and availability and interest from them. And that's a lot nonverbal eye contact. There's ways people open up physically, even before words. And then I approach physically or energetically um, in resonance. So I kind of meet them where they are and, and, and have this uh, communication that spans the distance between us. Or sometimes with my own eyes, I attract people to come toward me. And you're like, oh. So Isabel wanted to know how I kept dancing when the pandemic hit, as I was dancing four or five times a week. It was my social world, my family, my work, a lot of things for me. And all of a sudden, whoosh, that was it. Don't get to do that anymore. I called on the connecting and partnering skills that I'd already developed in the many years of dancing with thousands of others in the various live dances that I've attended. And I experimented online a little bit with another person about dancing in the Zoom space. And I figured out how to adapt the skills that we can use in person into the two dimensional Zoom space. Just like we've done here today. We do one thing physically with people and there's just another thing that happens when you're only have the eye contact really. You can't do use the other senses. A little bit of sound. And then I had the opportunity to coach someone who was uh, a producer of dance, um, how she could set the Zoom up and what she could include so that people could connect and move together and try to feel that same kind of joy and connection that I described about how when I dance in person. And a lot of online dances sprung up and I danced in a lot of them and uh, learned how to, you know, really learned how to hone in on this and really invite people. Because again, I can't really move closer to people. I can't really call out to them. There's just limited ways when someone's moving on the screen that I can find that we can actually dance together and get them to dance with me or offer myself to dance with them. 
And then in addition to that, I found other activities to meet the needs that, I, uh, that I'd been being met through dance, um, like a lot of exercise, I like movement. So I was biking more and connecting online just with people verbally, just the deep intimacy of sharing verbally and listening and speaking and holding space for people. And I uh, amped up my solo movement at home as well. So those kind of met my needs and I actually found, guess what? I thought I would die without all that dancing in person, but you know what? I didn't. And even to the point where I left my California home, which was the Mecca for all this dancing and moved myself to Texas where there isn't any of that kind of dancing yet. So what have I learned about humanity and what have I learned about community? We all wanna be seen and known and appreciated by others. Once we experience this blessing from another, and it really does take somebody cherishing us and spending time and holding space, at least it did for me before I could actually go, oh, that's what I want. That's what it feels like. And when that happens, I learned to see and know and appreciate myself. And then from there, I could offer that to other people. I do know how fragile we all are and how much we need to be resonated with and reflected by others. And I know how essential a sense of belonging and feeling cared about is. And I've learned how needed and emotionally necessary and supportive it is to build intimacy and community through consistent, deep, personal sharing and listening to each other with our caring hearts. How are we doing for time, Isabel? I don't wanna take more time than I need here and I am not tracking it. Can you speak up and let me know? Sure. Oh, we have about 10 minutes left of the service. I know we have a song to close with and uh, final words. So you have a few more minutes if you want to wrap up or okay. invite. Perfect. I'm actually right about there. That sounds yeah. good. So how do I access courage during a dance? She asked me, what makes a dance safe? And this might sound repetitive, but the best teachers repeat. And not that I'm a teacher. I'm an inspirer, I hope. But in my experience, it's the interconnection and attunement with my own inner knowing and with my authentic inner voice, and then acting from that guidance that establishes my sense of safety. I feel safe and confident as I stay attuned and responsive to my own inner guidance and not discount it, override it, push it aside and force myself or you know, try to step over it. In the absence of that responsive connection, really without it, no one, no thing can make me safe. Life continually changes and shifts all around me, just like it does in, in a contact dance. I may find ways to have influence, but I can't control it. But there is a clear, constant and current voice within me. And when I listen and trust, and act in harmony with that inner guidance, I can be sure that I am connected to something greater and wiser than my own fragile mind. During really speedy contact dances, my human mind cannot think fast enough to keep me safe. When I let go of thinking and surrender to my body's knowing and dance, I find my body skillfully keeps me safe. And in life, with my felt sense as a constant reference and companion, I am able to stay present with my full experience held in love and embraced by my fullest aliveness. Do I do final words here, Isabel? Or does that come later? Let's sing. 
let's sing now and we'll do the final okay, words perfect. after we sing. Thank and you. I believe Renee will, can you lead us in the song? Oh yeah, that would be good. So Thank Renee, you for your wonderful attention. I apologize for half reading this, but I spent a lot of time writing it and I hope you felt connected with, I can see you on the screen better mm -hmm. now. Thanks for being here. Lovely. All right, thank, thank you, you so me. much. So Harmony suggested we sing this lovely little tune. Um, I actually learned it when I was in Girl Scouts. I don't know if anyone else knows it, but it's called Make New Friends, okay? So I'm gonna sing it once, and then we're gonna do it as a round, okay? So just so you are familiar with it, it's, Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other's gold. Looks like a lot of you know it, so that's perfect. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna split the room in half. So from here, this way, you're one group. And there, that way, you're the other group. So we're gonna sing it four times, or each group is gonna sing it four times, right? And I'll cue when you start, okay? Ready? Make new friends, but keep the old. Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other's gold. Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other's gold. Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other's gold. Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other's gold. Lovely, well done. Now we'll pull Harmony back up on the screen for our closing words and chalice extinguishing. Life comes to us as it does. We aren't in charge of life and we can't control it. We can only choose how we focus our attention and sometimes we don't even feel in charge of that. Four important keys, for me at least, appear to be, number one, trusting that we're an essential part of something larger and wiser than ourselves and resting in that interconnectedness and interdependence. Two, accepting and being with where we are in the moment. Three, allowing ourselves to be called towards something and for risking following that call that risking following that call life is happening and it keeps on happening there's nothing we can do about it but stay on that pony and ride thank you very much <laughs>